Hare Krishna, everyone. Um, we're live for the World Holy Name Festival Week. So I'm going to be speaking. And my name is Surabi Kunj Devidasi, and I will be speaking a little bit about the Holy Name. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that um, I'm so inspired by everybody who has already spoken about the Holy Name. There's been some amazing classes. Savya Sachi was so inspiring. Um, Rukmini and Gorobumi, their conversation completely blew my mind. Uh, it was just the best. Uh, please go and check it out if you haven't already. Um, that really, it, that the honesty and the confessions <laughs> of the uh, uh, Japa, it was just really, really inspiring to me. So um, I'm taking a lot of inspiration from all the previous speakers and I hope that uh, I can say something of value uh, if not to any of you then maybe to me um, okay uh, Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adi Takadhadara Shiva Sari Gauravata Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare um, So today I'm just going to be speaking on some realizations I had about the holy name and um, what's been helping me with my japa because um, I think, well, I don't know if anyone else has any uh, struggles with Japa, but I, I definitely do and have for very long. Um, so I'm just going to share some some of what's been inspiring me. Um, but my first realization about the Holy Name is that uh, we don't see it, but everything we have comes from the Holy Name. Um, it just as, like in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it states how this whole material creation comes from sound vibration. That's the first, most subtle material element, uh, if you will. But um, so the Srimad Bhagavatam says that all the material elements expand from sound. In the third canto, it's described that sound creates the ethereal sky and the ability to hear. And those interactions lead to the sense of touch and air which leads to form perceived as fire and the ability to see. And these interactions create water and the sense of taste, which eventually leads to earth and the sense of smell. And from earth, everything we perceive uh, is here. So, so from sound, all of these material elements expand and um, that's this material creation. So in the same way for us in our spiritual lives, everything comes from the holy name um, the spiritual sound vibration golokera premadhana the holy name is imported from the spiritual world so it's completely pure and because it has come everything in front of us that we see becomes manifest all of our temples deities festivals prashadam everything that we can perceive with our other senses our sight our sense of taste hearing everything comes from the holy name um, for me that's it may sound obvious <laughs> to all of you but for me that was a big uh, realization because it's easy to think when you're in a festival that the holy name is part of the festival like i always think of ratiyatra because we haven't had a durban ratiyatra for a few years now um, but i'm always thinking of like the you know the prashadam and the cows and the festival atmosphere and the book distribution and um, you know the all all the glamour about it you know the deities just the procession just the excitement of it all and I'm always in awe of our temples and deities and just everything that we experience but and you think okay kirtan's part of it um, the holy name is part of it, but actually the holy name is the only reason it's here. The only reason we're having this. Um, the, e everything comes from the holy name. So, um, so I kind of think of the holy name as that thread on which all the pearls are strung. 
So the pearls are the festival, the deities, Prashada, devotee association, you know, all of our senior devotees that we love so much. They're the pearls. And then the holy name is that unseen thread that, so, that carries everything, that everything is coming from. Um, so it's, it's very, uh, it's, it's the essence of our spiritual practice, even though sometimes uh, we, we, we can easily put, the, like get too busy in our services and get too busy with all the other aspects. And we, you know, struggle to find time to chant our japa. But it's actually that the japa leads to all of this other, um, all of these other aspects of our spiritual life. Um, so, and, and Srila Prabhupada also, I mean, we saw this with his example. He just went to New York and chanted the, the Maha Mantra under the Hare Krishna tree. And from that, this whole movement came. Like we didn't have temples, we didn't have deities, we didn't have anything. We didn't have that many devotees, but from the mantra, everything became manifest. So just as in this material world sound, material sound creates everything, for our spiritual lives, spiritual sound creates everything that we have. Um, and we know that sound has created this material world and sound is the way to dissolve it. It's the way to get out of it. And that sound is the spiritual sound, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So um, I just want to spend a lot of my time reading from this book, um, Japa by Buri Jan Prabhu. Um, this book has greatly inspired me. I feel like I don't have anything to share personally um, from my own realization because uh, I don't I don't have much knowledge of uh, the, the glories of the holy name and how to improve but this book this book has greatly transformed my life um, it it's helped me to prioritize my japa previously it's so easy to just start chanting in between other activities or going like you're on the way to a place and it's a 20 minute drive so you can do like a few rounds there or if you're scrolling through you know just reading quick messages while you know bead bags in one hand and the phones in the other it's very bad habits but I have done this and even sometimes just like turning on the computer and logging into the email um, or or while other people are around and we're all just like having a conversation I'll just chant and so I really wanted to come out of these habits which can get really really um, ingrained in us and make our Jaffa experience not that grand so um, this book by Buri Jan Prabhu has helped me so much and um, it, it really emphasizes the importance of serious japa and there's a lot of tips on how to improve in our japa and also um, it tells us what to avoid. Um, it demystifies the mind. The, be the biggest realization I had from this book was that it demystified the mind. It, it, the mind was not this complicated thing anymore. It's, it's very clearly explaining to us exactly what our mind is doing, exactly all the traps that the mind is going to put and that's going to destroy our japa um, and so that we can become a bit more wise to avoid them. Um, so I will be reading a lot from this book. Um, so. This, at the beginning of the book, there's a beautiful meditation uh, from the Briyad Bhagavatam Rita. All glories, all glories to the all blissful holy name of Sri Krishna, which causes the devotee to give up all conventional religious duties, meditation and worship. When somehow or other uttered even once by a living entity, the holy name awards him liberation. The holy name of Krishna is the highest nectar. It is my very life and my only treasure. This is from Sri Brihad Bhagavatam Rita 119. So the first part of this book, Burijan Prabhu explains um, the first verse of Shikshastakam. And actually th uh, during this book, uh, Prabhu references each verse and takes us on a journey meditatively um, through the stages, actually, uh, 
using each verse from the Shikshastakam, but I'm just going to pick out um, some inspiring points from uh, all over this book. So the Shikshastakam verse is, Let there be all victory for the chanting of the holy name of Lord Krishna, which can cleanse the mirror of the heart and stop the miseries of the blazing fire of material existence. That chanting is the waxing moon that spreads the white lotus of good fortune for all living entities. It is the life and soul of all education. The chanting of the holy name of Krishna expands the blissful ocean of transcendental life. It gives a cooling effect to everyone and enables one to taste full nectar at every step. <clears throat> so. This verse, Cheto Darpana Marjanam, Bhava Maha Davagni Nirvapanam, Shreya Kairava Chandrika Vitaranam, Vidya Vadu Jeevanam, Anandam Budhi Vardhanam, Pratipatam Purnamritas Vadanam, Sarvatma Snapanam Param Vijayate Shri Krishna Sankirtanam. So this is the verse, the first verse of Shikshastakam. And it's a long verse. There's a lot of really potent points packed in that one verse. So Burijan Prabhu breaks it down for us. And he said there's eight things to be gained from the holy name. Just by reading this verse, we can see. Cheto Darpana Marjanam. Chanting Krishna's names cleanses Marjanam, the mirror, Darpana, of the heart, Chetas. Because we have taken so many births, during which we filled our consciousness with dust, dirt, material desire, and unlimited other material impressions, the mirror of the heart has become buried. Our consciousness has been covered for millions of years. Imagine a mirror covered by 30 kilometers of dust. If we were to look in such a mirror, what would we see? We certainly wouldn't see ourselves. We would see only dust. When we see ourselves only through material consciousness and then act based on what we perceive, it means the dirt in the heart is reacting only with itself. Who we truly are remains forever unperceivable. A chanting cleanses the mirror of the heart and consciousness. This cleansing process can take years, even lifetimes, or we can complete it in a moment if we chant Krishna's names even once without offense. The Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya Lila, chapter 15, verse 107 states, Eka Krishna Name Kare Sarva Papakshaya. Simply by chanting the holy name of Krishna once, a person is relieved from all the reactions of a sinful life. Pure chanting can remove our whole material existence and establish us as loving servants of Krishna. So that's the first point that we can gain from Shikshastakam, that it cleanses the mirror of the heart, of all the dust that we've accumulated for lifetimes. The next point. Bhava Maha Davagni Nirvapanam. When enough dirt is removed, the great forest fire, Maha Davagni, of material life is extinguished. Nirvapanam. The next point. Shreya Kairava Chandrika Vitaranam. The awakening of our spiritual identity, the white lotus of our true good fortune, Shreya Kairava, spreads. Vitaranam, its leaves, and begins to blossom in the cooling moonbeams, Chandrika, of Krishna's holy names. So this is something that's really nice to picture when we're chanting the holy names. A white lotus of good fortune, blooming. Thus far, Mahaprabhu has used two metaphors to illustrate the effects of chanting Krishna's names. A mirror to destroy our identity, a mirror to describe our identity, telling us that we must cleanse this mirror in order to see ourselves, and the blossoming of the lotus flower, that gradual revelation of our eternal identity in relationship with Krishna. The next point, Vidya Vadu Jivanam. This phrase literally means the life of the wife of knowledge and requires clarification. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur explains that just as a wife naturally follows her husband, so transcendental knowledge naturally follows the chanting of Krishna's holy names. Transcendental knowledge begins with the understanding that we are eternal souls and not the body and approaches completion when we realize our relationship with Krishna, Sambandha. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains, Blossoming fully, the flower of the holy name takes me to Vraja and reveals to me his own love dalliance. 
This name gives, me, gives to me my own eternal spiritual body, keeps me right by Krishna's side, and completely destroys everything related to this mortal frame of mine. Sharanagati Sri Nama Mahatmya verse 7 This means that chanting the holy name is sufficient. It can reveal to us our eternal relationship with Krishna. No other spiritual process is required. The next point. Anandam Buddhi Vardhanam. This is my favorite. Bliss is the natural condition of the soul. Chanting the holy name releases the heart and releases in the heart an ever-increasing ocean of transcendental ecstasy. Next thing, next point. Pratipadam Purnamrita Svadhanam. Pratipadam, step by step, our taste, Svadhana, becomes full, Purna, and that taste is nectarian. We will be able to relish the nectarian taste for which the soul hankers. The soul, the soul separated from Krishna lives in a desert. When someone lives in a desert, his tongue becomes dry, and while searching for water, he tends to follow mirages sometimes to his death. There is no water in a desert, no way to satisfy his hankering, but the holy name is fully satisfying, and chanting it saturates the soul with the rich nectar of Krishna's service. The next point, Sarvatma Snapanam. The holy name bathes the soul, cleansing it of all subtle and gross contamination, and immerses it in ecstasy. The Maha Mantra is capable of inducing the highest ecstasy in the heart. Because the Holy Name gives these effects, Param Vijayate Shri Krishna Sankirtanam. So these are seven effects that the Holy Name gives. And the eighth one is that it is supremely Param, victorious, Jayate over material existence. It destroys the material world and establishes the soul in a world of joy. So... That's how we get out of this material world, by fully realizing the holy name in this way that it's been described. Um, first, as something that's going to cleanse our heart, you know, um, extinguish the forest fire of material existence, but then also give us that pure transcendental happiness, that ever increasing bliss, anandam buddhi vardhanam, and that's going to make us taste it like we'll be able to taste and feel that love uh, that happiness and therefore it can destroy this material world um so burijan Prabhu goes on to say like if we we know all of this about the holy name uh so why don't we want to chant it if we know it's so great um and he mentions that there's four causes for lack of taste um and he describes them as there's a lack of spiritual understanding of ourselves and of Krishna, which is called Tattva Vibrama. Um, if we only superficially understand ourselves as being servants of Krishna, then we will not have taste for chanting because we don't see ourselves as servants. Um, we're identifying with our material body and material mind. And therefore, um, we won't want to chant these holy names. Um, and, and also that we don't know Krishna. If we knew Krishna, then we would want to chant his holy names all the time if we, know, if we knew who he is. So it's a lack of understanding that can cause lack of taste in chanting the holy names. Um, the second cause of lack of taste is Asat Krishna. Thirst for the temporary, um, which can come in, the, in a few ways. The, the desire for material comforts, desiring heavenly pleasures or mystic powers or the desire for liberation. So if we maintain these desires, these temporary desires, then it will cause lack of taste. The third cause is Hridaya Dorbalyam, which, re which refers to weakness of the heart and in spe uh, specifically relates to two weaknesses, attachment to, to objects unrelated to Krishna and deceit fault-finding, envy, and the desire for fame. And the fourth uh, cause of lack of taste is offenses, aparad. Um, so we should avoid this at all costs um, because it, it ruins our chanting. I mean, we have the 10 offenses, that, so we know um, that inattention, and, and these lead to inattention. 
So these are very important to avoid. Um, so in this book, Burijan Prabhu speaks about the glory of the holy name and also the pitfalls, like why don't we want to chant? So the, that was, the four causes of lack of taste was the first part. And then uh, he also goes on to describe the functions of the mind. So this is the part I really enjoyed reading this book because um, the mind was no longer a mystery. I could understand why I have so many problems in chanting. Um, so or, or in just controlling my mind. So one of the main points um, Prabhu mentioned is that the mind is the protector of the false ego. So it's not specific. So the mind just accepts and rejects. It's the false ego that is actually destroying our chanting because the false ego maintains an identity that is material. Um, the false ego does not want to admit that we are servants of Krishna. So, and, and the, false e the false ego, that's, that's the definition of false ego. It's a false identity, not understanding who we truly are. So the mind protects that by getting happy when we are praised or by getting angry when we are dishonored or when people treat us badly, then the mind jumps in to protect the false ego, protect our image, or um, gets elated when we are glorified. So that's one of the main functions of the mind, which will hamper our japa, that accepting, rejecting, and protecting the false ego. Because if the false ego is protected, then we won't we won't be able to dissolve it we won't be able to go back to godhead basically we won't be able to realize our true selves because we're maintaining our identity as the body the mind our reputation um our our job our relationships our family we're maintaining these identities in this world that is not related to krishna and therefore we won't be able to chant so that's one of the key functions of the mind um, another, another function of the mind, which I find, which I didn't think about before, but um, I related to, was that the mind is a relisher of mundane rasa. So, what this means is that the mind enjoys tasting mundane emotions and feelings. Um, so and and the mind relishes the taste of pleasure and pain alike which might be hard to admit so uh, in the book burijan prabhu says the truth is that unless we have something spiritually relishable on which to focus the mind the mind will not stay controlled determination is rarely enough the mind wants to taste in its mundane form, it relishes the material emotion evoked by the world's dualities. When we think of pleasant things, our family or friends, for example, we feel the heart, the seat of the mind's emotion, expand. When we think of unpleasant things, our enemies or a trauma, the heart contracts. This expansion and contraction is actually the mind tasting emotion. We tend to think that the mind wishes to taste only the sweetness of friendship or success, but it tastes the negativity with equal vigor. Each side of a duality creates an opposite but equally powerful feeling. Because the mind wants to taste both poles, it will drag us from pleasure to pain and back again. If we think we can focus only on positive emotion, we are deluding ourselves. This is the relative world. Everything that creates positive emotion has its counterpart in the negative. There is no meaning to friend without enemy. Traveling between dualities is how the mind keeps us engaged in materialism, forcing us to remain in the cycle of repeated birth and death. Although we want to taste the pleasure of friendship without tasting the pain of enmity, to taste the pleasure of success without the misery of failure, to taste love without hate, we are unable. Still, we become bound by the desire and by our attachment to emotional experience. In this world, every emotion can only be defined against its opposite. The mind can literally keep us engaged forever in the struggle between dualities. So, I think um, this book 
perfectly describes the situation because we think we only want happiness. We only want to focus on the happy. But the mind actually relishes, enjoys both happiness and sadness, both pleasure and pain. We see it because it wants something to think about, something mundane. It wants to distract us. So we're meant to be focusing on Krishna. We're meant to be absorbed in Krishna. But the mind will... Sorry, I got interrupted. Um, the, um, I was saying we, we want to focus on Krishna. We're meant to be meditating on Krishna. But the mind will be relishing pleasure and pain. That's why we can focus so much on our sufferings just um, just because the mind enjoys it, even if our heart doesn't. Um, another function of the mind is that it is like a projector. Um, it's described in this book to be a projector that is projecting all of the happiness and pain we've experienced in our life, like a TV. So during our japa, it's flashing these images and thoughts through, uh, through the way a projector would, and we are responding. Um, so, Prabhu says, picture the mind as a projector projecting on smoke. What do we do? I, I keep getting interrupted. Um, okay. Picture the mind as a projector, projecting on smoke. What will we see? Perhaps we will make out the form of a tiger or a train racing toward a car or someone of the opposite sex. But smoke has no substance. Similarly, similarly none of the mind's imagery, no matter how intensely the mind presents it, has substance. Again, pull the tricky mind back by assigning it the simplest ta of tasks to chant. So um, this was very vivid. I could definitely relate to this, that the mind is just projecting these images and none of them are actually real. Even if their experiences have happened to us in this life, they're not real in the sense of them being eternal. Um, another function of the mind is that it's always, it's never in the present. It's always lamenting the past or anxious about the future, um, which is why we can't focus. And the mind likes to fixate on our sufferings, um, which is some of the reasons we give ourselves as to why we can't chant. So um, I, I like this description that's given in this a book, in this book, Japa, also. If we could turn our present life into a film, mine would run 60 years to date, then speed up the movie so that it took only one minute to show our whole life, the good, bad, friends, enemies, and everything else. What would it all mean in that short span of time? We are eternal souls. What does our current spot life, as Srila Prabhupada called it, signify in the face of eternal time? When we were four years old, we might have experienced something that felt terrible to us. Now, seeing it from the perspective of a 60-year-old, the event is insignificant if we even remember it. Or perhaps something wonderful happened. We won an award in the fifth grade, completely insignificant now. To protect our false ego and false sense of self, the mind imposes a sense of significance on the inconsequential. Whether good or bad events cross the mind, all of them are insignificant from the point of view of eternity. In that sense, material attachments are truly ridiculous. Perhaps I desire to accumulate money, but if I become a billionaire for an eighth of a second, what value would it have? So the mind, so, so this brings us the, the perspective of our eternal identity, our identity as eternal spiritual souls, and why we can't let anything in this world stop us from chanting our japa and stop us from, or just distracting us from our relationship with Krishna, because those things, if you had to, um, I really like the analogy of the film, because if you look at a film, it's like really long, you know, the old film tapes. Our life, our present life is just one stroke in it. So 
um, it's so it's so insignificant, even if it feels like the end of the world. And um, the last function of the mind that I noted down, of course, there's so many, but I, I noted these, um, that the mind is like advertising. It's always advertising something to us that we may or may not need. Um, well, most of the time we don't <laughs> need, but it's always throwing in some adverts. Um, so, Burijan Prabhu says, the mind sees something and becomes attached. At that moment, the object becomes the most important thing in creation, and people will buy it without thought, spending thousands of dollars on some scarcely needed item. Later, when the mind has released its grip, that same purchase is revealed as impractical and frivolous. Unfortunately, because we fail to realize that we were victimized by our own mind and senses, we foolish mind worshippers repeat this pattern throughout our lives. What ruins our japa more than anything, dragging us into inattention, is that we believe the mind's advertisements. We are easily convinced that we must follow every mental impulse, every thought, now, even while we are doing something as vital as chanting the holy name. And the mind makes every passing thought epic. So this is a way the mind tricks us. And it even says that we have been tricked by the land. We have been lied to by the mind because our mind is convincing us that everything else is so important to focus on. All these advertisements, all these TV projections, um, all of these past pleasures and pains or hopes of the future, it's more important than our japa when it actually isn't. So um, now I want to get into the the positive part of it because I just explained a whole bunch on the, the functions of the mind and uh, the four causes of lack of taste. So now here's the, the tips that are given in this book. Um, Burijan Prabhu gives nine keys to improve our japa. The first one is just chant. So at all costs, whatever it takes, do not ever let go of the Maha Mantra. We are given the Maha Mantra. It's, it's a huge gift and not everybody has it, which means it, and it's so precious. So we must share it. So just continue to chant. Um, at, just never, ever give up the Maha Mantra. The second key is listen to just one mantra. And I've, I've tried this. This is really, um, this has really helped me a lot. Like I explained how my japa was not good. And I'm not saying that it's much, I'm not saying that it's excellent, but it's significantly better because I'm trying to apply this. It's not always working. But, um, but the, the focus is to just listen to one mantra. So when we sit down, the key is to be present. Um, for a mind that's always fixating on the future or lamenting about the past, um, as my mind usually is, I don't know if anybody relates to that, but mine can be, uh, to, to remain present is quite a struggle. So if we just listen to one mantra, the mantra that we're chanting now, um, that forces the mind to be present and then the mind can actually focus on Krishna. Um, so when it, it said that if we can focus on one mantra, it means that we're slowing the mind down to living in the present, which allows us to focus on Krishna in the present. Um, it's, it's hard to do this because Purishan Prabhu explains in the book that the first thing you do, if you listen to just one mantra, the mind will immediately celebrate that, yay, I've listened to just one mantra. So it's hard to, it, it's, a, it's a something we have to constantly remember with each passing mantra. And that we, when we're chanting this one mantra and then it's present, and then when we go to the next one, we shouldn't be celebrating the previous one, nor should we be thinking, oh no, I've got 15 more rounds of mantras. So how will I listen to just one mantra in those rounds. We just focus on the now. Um, the third key is state your determination. So this means write it down, but take a sankalpa, like, uh, like an intention, state your intention 
to chant attentively and be specific. So we, we, we don't want to say like, I want to chant attentively. That, that is specific, but it's not as specific as it can be. We can say, I want to chant and listen to just one mantra, the mantra I'm chanting now. Um, the fourth key is when the mind wanders, bring it back. So this is, this is what we've, we've heard from the Bhagavad Gita verse, um, from wherever the mind wanders, from wherever the mind wanders due to its flickering nature, we must bring it back under the control of the self. So in the same way, um, we will find that our mind is wandering during japa. The key is to not give up and not become despondent like, well, what's the point? Um, I've just, my mind has wandered. I've ruined my japa. It's, it's that we always can come back. We can always, there's always hope. We're always coming back. And therefore we, are, we need that determination. That's why it's a state, the determination previously. So have that determination to bring the mind back each time. Even if we stated like, I will listen to the mantra I'm chanting now. And if my mind wanders, I will bring it back. Um, that kind of intention is really helpful. The fifth key is detachment. Um, and the reason he says it is because we can't change all the bad mantras we've chanted in the past. Um, when we're chanting and we find that we have not listened to our mantra, or our mind has wandered, there's nothing we can do about it. The time has passed. So instead of spending the future mantras fixating on the, those past mantras, like, oh, this previous mantra was so bad, we're making the next mantra worse. And then the next mantra and the next mantra is just going to carry on like that. So we need to have detachment that even if we've chanted 15 rounds horribly, we can't fixate on it. We have to just say, okay, right now I need to focus on my rounds. I need to just hear the one mantra. Um, and so we definitely can't let that distract us. And we also should not be worried about how we chant the future mantras because that, um, I think when you sit down to chant your rounds, um, Kadama Kanana Swami says, sometimes you experience panic. When we first sit down to chant our rounds, the first thing we feel is panic because we have like 16 rounds to do, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't feel like that. Um, the next point is to neglect the mind. So this is very, very, um, we've heard this from Srila Prabhupada and this is very important because there's in this book, Puritan Prabhu explains that we shouldn't trust the mind. Um, Srila Prabhupada says, there's one easy weapon with which the mind can be conquered, neglect. The mind is always telling us to do this or that. Therefore, we should be very expert in disobeying the mind's orders. Gradually, the mind should be trained to obey the orders of the soul. It is not that one should obey the orders of the mind. So, um, this is clearly stated that the mind's always going to be throwing things and we need to just ignore it. Um, in an, uh, this book also says that there's a, there's a caption here saying, the mind is not to be trusted. Um, Maharaj Parikshit asks Sukadev Goswami an important question. Why didn't Rishabhadev use his mystic powers even for the good of others? After all, Rishabhadev is the supreme personality of Godhead. He cannot be bewildered by Maya or deviated from the devotional path the way Jivas can. Sukadev responds, my dear king, you have spoken correctly. However, after capturing animals, a cunning hunter does not put faith in them, for they might run away. Similarly, those who are advanced in spiritual life do not put faith in the mind. Indeed, they, are, they always remain vigilant and watch the mind's actions. This is from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 5, Chapter 6, Verse 2. It is dangerous to let the mind run wild. All the learned scholars agree. The mind is by nature restless and we should not make friends with it. If we place our full trust in the mind, it can cheat us at any moment. Even Lord Shiva, the great ascetic, was sexually agitated when he saw Lord Vishnu's Mohini Murti form. 
And so Vairi Muni fell down from his mature stage of yogic perfection after watching fish copulate. Sukadev Goswami continues, An unchaste woman is very easily carried away by paramours, and it sometimes happens that her husband is violently killed by her paramours. If the yogi gives his mind a chance and does not restrain it, his mind will give facility to enemies like lust, anger and greed, and they will doubtlessly kill the yogi. The mind is the root cause of lust, anger, pride, greed, lamentation, illusion and fear. Combined, these constitute bondage to fruitive activities. What learned man would put faith in the mind? So these are heavy instructions, um, but it's true. It's the truth. So Srila Prabhupada provides a solution. Always engage the mind in Krishna consciousness. Don't trust it. Neglect it especially while you're chanting japa and engage it simply in hearing the mantra. So even though those instructions are very heavy, um, they're all true and Prabhupada is so merciful to give us this perfect process so that we can engage this very difficult obstacle in our Krishna consciousness. Um, the next key to improve our japa is humility. Um, so we know the verse Trinada Pisuni Chena Tarod Ivasa Hishnana Amani Namana Dena Kirtanya Sadahari. We can only chant the holy names if we are as humble as a blade of grass and more tolerant than a tree and not expecting any praise but giving all praise to others. Um, it's easier to be humble when we are honest. Uh, Kadamba Kanana Swami says that. Only if we are honest can we become humble. And honesty means admitting to ourselves who we are and being honest about who we are, about our shortcomings, not pretending to be better than we are, um, not trying to keep up appearances. Uh, true honesty means that even if it is to our detriment, we will be honest. Even if it does not benefit us and causes us even if it disadvantages us, just to maintain honesty, um, that grows humility. Because when we are honest, then we will take the steps to improve. If we are not honest about who we are and our practice or just anything, if we're not honest about our spiritual life, our material life even, then we will never take the journey to improve it. So honesty means that there's a chance we can improve because we're admitting it to ourselves and others that we, and we can get the help we need for our japa or for anything. Um, the next key to improve our japa is to find shelter at the feet of the holy name. Um, in this book, Japa, there's a beautiful song by Bhaktivinoda Thakur that I'd really love to um, share with you because it's just amazing. This song is des describing the third verse of the Shikshastakam, um, Shikshastakam song 3. If your mind is always absorbed in chanting the glories of Lord Krishna with great care, then by that process of Sri Krishna Kirtan, you will attain transcendental qualification. You should give up all false pride and always consider yourself to be worthless, destitute and lower and more humble than a blade of grass. You should practice forgiveness like that of a tree and giving up violence toward other living beings, you should protect and maintain them. In the course of passing your life, you should never give anxiety to others, but rather do good to them while forgetting about your own happiness. When one has thus become a great soul, possessing all good qualities, one should abandon all desires for fame and honor and make one's heart humble. Knowing that Lord Krishna resides within all living entities, one should with great respect consistently show honor to all beings. By possessing these four qualities, humility, mercifulness, respect toward others, and the renunciation of desires for prestige, one becomes virtuous. In such a state, you may sing the glories of the Supreme Lord. 
Weeping, Bhakti Vinod submits his prayer at the lotus feet of the Lord. O oh Lord, when will you give me the qualification for possessing attributes such as these? So this is such a beautiful prayer, um, such a beautiful song, and really showing us how to take shelter of the holy name. Um, and the ninth key to improve our japa is Krishna's causeless mercy, which um, this is the most important key actually, because we can't do anything without Krishna's causeless mercy. So if we really want to chant with absorption, um, we need the mercy. And the way we can get the mercy is to beg for it and pray and put our effort in. Show Krishna that we are here in our japa conversation and we're putting our energy, we're giving him our energy. Um, I really loved Rukmini and Gaurabhumi's talk a few days ago about this, about um, like the relationship with the Holy Name is a relationship. So we need to give it the time and energy we would give to a relationship. We need to be present. When someone's talking to you, you're not going to be on your phone. You're not going to be talking to other people while they're talking to you. So we need to give our energy and time and attention to the Holy Name. The way we would give our energy to our friends and our families. Um, and there was, uh, there's this, so this is, um, ch chanting with absorption, basically. We need to be absorbed. And there's one more thing I'd like to read from Japa about chanting with absorption, like what it uh, means. There's this beautiful analogy of a woman. Um, so there's a Brahmana who's just meditating in the forest. And then this woman just runs past and like kind of knocked into him, but she didn't stop. She just carried on. And the Brahmana was upset. And then she came back later. And then the Brahmana approached her like, and you no, know, then she started offering him respect this time. But the Brahmana was confused. He said, you just walked past me. You didn't offer me respect. Why are you doing this now? And then she said, I am so sorry. But when I was running in the other direction, I was hurrying to meet my lover. I didn't notice you, but saw only my lover in my mind. Now I am returning from my rendezvous and have regained my awareness of everything around me. And Burijan Prabhu says, Note the respective absorption of the young woman and the Brahmana. Because the Brahmana was meditating, but he noticed her, but she did not notice the Brahmana because she was absorbed in love. When one is in love, absorption in the object of love is so deep that practically speaking, nothing else exists. So I hope that these tips from <laughs> Purijan Prabhu's book help and they definitely helped me. Um, I can say that now I've also, another tip that I've started implementing is just waking up early so that I don't have all those distractions I previously had with my phone or laptop or just, you know, talking to people or driving in cars. Um, waking up early has significantly removed the distractions. Um, and I just, there's this book here, Kirtanya Sadahari, which has a beautiful meditation that I wanted to end off with. And it's just um, Kadamba Kanana Swami's meditations. And I think it's nice to also think of this when we uh, chant. My small island. My Krishna consciousness is a small island. It's hard to stay there. The mind wants freedom and to explore the horizons. I sit and chant. The three modes of material nature touch the shores of my island. My island is glorious though. It is made of pure, transcendental Chintamani touchstone. It has forests of desire trees of devotional service. It also has some hills of austerity, some trees and creepers of distraction. I sit and chant. In the middle of my island is the reservoir of pleasure, and in the heart of it, there is a beautiful golden temple of Lord Chaitanya, Mahaprabhu's mercy, where devotees worship the greatest ever jewel of the holy name. Prabhupada is the pujari assisted by his dedicated followers. 
this is where I sit and chant. So that is such a beautiful image. Um, I love to picture this when I chant because it, it just sounds amazing. Um, it's the spiritual world actually, the Chintamani gems and the desire trees. But to picture a temple of Lord Chaitanya and the holy name is what's being worshipped. And Pra Srila Prabhupada is the Pujari. It's, it's a perfect vision. I can picture it. In fact, I feel like Tompkins Square Park is like that also because Srila Prabhupada is there worshipping the holy name, being the Pujari and worshipping the holy name. Um, so I hope this has inspired you. Um, I read I read such a beautiful verse from the Chaitanya Charitamrita just the other day and it speaks about the mercy of Lord Chaitanya and we know that the holy name is the most easily accessible mercy of Lord Chaitanya that we have received and it's so easy for anybody to take it up, so in easy for anybody to chant, there's no rules and regulations, um, It's there's no barriers of gender, caste, creed, culture, nationality, everyone's allowed and everyone can get can receive the highest benediction, the highest love of Godhead um, and go back to Goloka Vrindavan from this mercy. So I just, it's it, Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya Leela chapter 10, verse 119. So this verse is um, recited by Swarup Damodar Goswami when he arrives in Jagannath Puri to see Lord Chaitanya. He offers obeisances and recites this verse. O ocean of mercy, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, let there be an awakening of your auspicious mercy, which easily drives away all kinds of material lamentation by making everything pure and blissful. Indeed, your mercy awakens transcendental bliss and covers all material pleasures. By your auspicious mercy, quarrels and disagreements arising among different scriptures are vanquished. Your auspicious mercy pours forth transcendental mellows and thus causes the heart to jubilate. Your mercy, which is full of joy, always stimulates devotional service and glorifies conjugal love of God. May transcendental bliss be awakened within my heart by your causeless mercy. So that is the blessing that I hope, um, that I pray for and I pray for everybody else to have such a blessing. It's such a beautiful verse. Um, and it really makes me appreciate the devotional service that we've been blessed with. In the purport, Sri Prabhupada explains the way Lord Chaitanya's mercy is manifest and it's manifest through devotional service. Um, the ability to engage in devotional service and we know that that devotional service comes from the holy name um, because in the holy name we're asking for devotional service and um, all these opportunities we have have all been manifest from that holy name so um, we're very very fortunate and therefore we must give this fortune to others we must share our good fortune with others so that they can also become fortunate and they can also relish the, the glory of the holy name and devotional service. So, um, Hare Krishna, uh, I hope that this inspired at least someone. Um, it was inspiring for me to have to research all of this to, to say and um, I'm hoping that uh, we can all just go deeper in our japa, go deeper in our Krishna consciousness. Satyam Param Dimahi. Let us meditate on the Supreme Absolute Truth. Hare Krishna.